are wrapping up our message series, this part of our message series on the book of Acts. We've called it Unstoppable because we've been looking at the very beginning of the church, the very beginning of churches just like this one, the very first Christians in the first few years of the history of the church. We've been digging into that over these weeks, looking at Acts chapter 1 all the way now into Acts chapter 9. And we'll pick it up again in 2022, but we're going to wrap it up this morning with a couple of miracles from the Apostle Peter that are recorded for us at the end of Acts chapter 9. And these miracles are incredible. They're special. They are miracles. We're going to get into it this morning. But I hope it's really going to help wrap things up for this part of the book of Acts that we've been getting into, because I want to share with you, especially what these early Christians were holding on to, why they had such boldness in their Christian lives what was unifying and bringing Christians together at the very beginning of the church, of the history of the church. You and I need to take hold of that for our lives. And I hope you're going to walk out of here this morning with a mindset, with a way of thinking about this week ahead of us of Thanksgiving, maybe Thanksgiving Day. Some of you are like, I can't wait. I can't wait for the food. And some of you are like, well, you don't know my family and what I'm dealing with. All right, yeah. But anyway, we're heading into this Thanksgiving week. And I hope you're going to walk out of here hugely encouraged to have the same kind of mindset that these first Christians had at the very beginning of the church, the same kind of boldness about Jesus. And the reason they had that is because they were thinking about things in a particular way. You know, we give thanks for things. We think about this week, and we're, we're going to give thanks for things. And we often give thanks for things about Jesus, and we should, just like we heard in the video earlier, that we can give thanks to God because he gave us his one and only son that Jesus died for us, that he rose again from the dead through faith in him. I'm now a child of God, those things. But there's something else to take hold of. There's something else to take hold of that these early Christians knew that I hope is going to make a difference in your Thanksgiving this year. And it's not just for Thanksgiving. It really should be every day. But I hope you'll walk out of here this morning with, a, with this kind of mindset. Now, let me set the stage for this. We're going to read at the end of Acts chapter 9. And just so you know dates, I like dates and order and knowing, putting things in place and how things fit together. We've just been reading in Acts chapter 9 about the conversion of Saul. That is his Jewish name. He's also known by his Roman name, Paul. It was very common that you would have two different names. Your Jewish parents would give you a name, and you'd also have a Roman name. Anyway, he was hunting down Christians, and you remember this, these last couple of weeks. Of all people, Jesus chose the apostle Paul to become the greatest missionary for the church. So the attention's been turned to the apostle Paul. He's going to become like the huge hero in the second half of the book of Acts. But in the meantime, Luke doesn't want us to lose sight of the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter is very, very, very special. He was the leader of the apostles who were also specially chosen by Jesus. But in particular, Jesus chose Peter, a rural fisherman, to become the leader of the church. The same man who had betrayed Jesus, remember, I mean, disowned him is probably a better way to say it. I don't even know who Jesus is when Jesus was arrested and he would later be crucified. But Jesus forgave him and restored him, and he becomes the leader of the church. And Peter was crucial. He's in the book of Acts. He's always there when something very important happens for the first time. So just so you understand the flow of this, we read that Paul has gone off to Tarsus, to Turkey, back to where he had grown up. And then it picks up with Peter. We go back to Peter. And Peter in Acts chapter 10, importantly, is going to go to perhaps absolute, maybe in the top few, the most important ports in the Roman Empire. It was actually in the Promised Land. It was called Caesarea Maritima, Caesarea by the Sea. And Peter is going to go there, and he's going to meet a Roman centurion, a Roman captain of the army garrison that is there for the Roman Empire. And he's going to go to his home, and God's going to work miraculously to bring Peter and Cornelius together, the Roman centurion. And Cornelius will be the first example of a Roman pagan, formerly pagan person. He's God-fearing, though. We're going to read about this next year. We'll get into Acts chapter 10. He's going to be, and his family and his entire household are going to be in examples of non-Jewish people who come to believe in Jesus and become a part of the church. And when Peter goes there, he preaches to Cornelius and his entire household, and as he's sharing about Jesus being the Savior of mankind, 
They come to believe his preaching, and the Spirit of God is poured out on them immediately. If you've been following along in the book of Acts, it was required of Jewish people, or especially around Jerusalem, to receive the Spirit, this blessing of God that the Spirit indwells them. If it happened for the first time on the day of Pentecost, they had to repent and be water baptized, and then they received the Spirit. Cornelius and his family become the pattern for us today, what we normally experience. We're not a part of the Jewish generation who killed the Messiah. There were special requirements put on them for, to get all of the blessings of, of the new covenant. Cornelius becomes the example for you and I of someone who comes to believe in Jesus. This is what happens today. And the moment you and I believe in Jesus as our Savior, not only are we justified by faith, not only are we born again, that happens for everyone in the moment that they believe, but we also receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. This is a new blessing of God, and we get the indwelling Spirit. Remember, this didn't happen for Old Testament believers. We receive the indwelling Holy Spirit in the moment we believe. We also have our sins forgiven, and we have easy access to forgiveness. We don't have to go to the temple anymore. We can simply pray and ask God for God's forgiveness, and we get it. This was totally radical. This was totally new in how God was relating to people. And this is the pattern for you. Well, that all happens for the first time the way you and I experience it today in Acts chapter 10. You, you hear this? So in Acts chapter 9, Luke goes back to the apostle Peter and he's going to perform two incredible miracles that are hopefully going to give us a totally new mindset. And it's also setting the stage that what happens in Acts chapter 10 is a thing of God. That God is really behind it. Because Peter performs these miracles, we can know that when Peter goes to Cornelius, that that was really real. That Jesus was behind it. Does this make sense? So here's what happens. We first get a, a summary verse of what the church was like. What was the mindset of these early Christians? Before we read about Peter. Peter's miracles. There's this incredible mindset that early Christians had. This is kind of like a summary verse, just like in Acts 2.42. I could spend like a whole message series just going through this one verse, but I won't do it. I won't do that. I won't, you know, I could be here for hours with you. You're like, okay. Right. Here's what it says. So the church, and this is the first time in the book of Acts that we hear of the church. And what that means is, yes, there are local churches just like this one. There are local churches all over the world that are meeting on the Lord's Day today, on Sundays, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. There are churches, there are believers who are gathering together, but there's also the church. All of us together as believers in all of our different localities, we make up Jesus' people, Jesus' assembly. Well, the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up like a building being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort, the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase in numbers is the picture there. Now, if you notice, we're not told anything in the book of Acts about the Galilee. This is really interesting. But nevertheless, during these years that we're looking at, Christian churches were coming together in the Galilee. Now, this is where Jesus spent, had spent most of his ministry. No doubt there were thousands of believers who were there. There are more coming to believe. The numbers are increasing in the Galilee. We've already heard about Samaria in the book of Acts. And we've also heard about Judea. So the apostle Peter is going to go to some different places. And we're going to see this actually lived out, what their mindset was. Because isn't it incredible? The, the early church, there was peace. Think about this for just a moment. In the times we're living in, the church had peace. Isn't that a wonderful word? It was being built up. That's a word for strengthening. It's a picture of a building being built. They were strengthening one another. They were comforted. They were encouraged. Don't you want to feel encouragement? Don't you want that hope? Don't you want people coming alongside of you and encouraging you as a believer? And in the midst of all that unity that this church had, the churches had, they were increasing in numbers. They were sharing about Jesus, and it was effective because they were unified together. They had noticed not only all of these, these, these senses, but they lived in the fear of the Lord. Let me summarize this for you again. There was peace. There was strength, there was encouragement, and there was growth. But that is because, we read in this verse, the Christians were living in the fear of the Lord Jesus Christ. An awe, a sense that he, listen to this, this is what's important, that he is 
alive. This is what made the actual difference. They lived in awe of Jesus. Jesus rose from the dead, yes, and he ascended into heaven, but he is also the living Lord Jesus Christ, their king. You and I have a king. He is alive. This is the beginning, I hope you can see, of the mindset these early Christians had. They had an awe and a respect for my king. He is alive, he's in heaven, but he is coming again. And I'm going to be held accountable because I serve him. He is my king and I, I, I am part of his kingdom. He's going to come, my Lord, my king. He's going to come again and I want to hear from him. Well done, good and faithful servant. So these Christians were living from day to day. Do you notice, notice this? In the fear of their king and awe and respect for him. Not only that, but notice they were depending on the Spirit of God. The encouragement they were giving to one another came from a supernatural experience of the Spirit of God allowing them to encourage one another. Why was the church getting stronger? Why was their message effective? Because they were depending on the Holy Spirit. This is really, really important for you and I. Every church... Every church should be a refuge. Do you know that? Every church should be a refuge from this world that's full of discouragement and division and anger and frustration all the time. That is our world. That is the world that we live in. And Christians, if you want encouragement, if you want to know peace, and you want to have that experience in your life, the key is to be connected to the church. It's supernatural. You'll never find it in other places. People will promise you all kinds of peace and joy and happiness and, and satisfaction and encouragement in your life. You won't find it. But the church is a place where we actually can take hold of it. And here's the thing. The unity that brings us about depends on how much you and your fellow brothers and sisters depend on the Holy Spirit. Our unity and our hope and our encouragement depends on how much we depend on the Holy Spirit. And he's alive. Our Savior and Lord, Jesus, is alive. The Spirit living in us, when we receive the Spirit, in the moment we believe in Jesus, the Spirit actually takes up residence in us. And he never leaves us. As I depend on the Spirit of God to bring forth transformation in my life. Show me, Spirit, how to encourage other people. Show me how to build up my church. As the leaders of a church do this, as the people who are involved in the church do this, then together we're unified, we're effective, we're growing. It all depends on how much we depend on the Spirit of God. You see, you're living, this is what the mindset was, you're living, powerful Lord Jesus in heaven. This is the mindset these early Christians have. Jesus is alive. Jesus, yes, died for them. He rose again from the dead. Yes, he had done that years before now. But he's still alive. And the Holy Spirit is actually living in them too. And they lived with that mentality. And they lived with the mentality that the Spirit and their Lord wanted to use them to build up the church, to build something until he comes again. When I was a Christian in my younger years as a Christian, I grew up and I believed when I was just a little boy, I remember in fifth grade, I got baptized and I grew up in a church and everything in the church, I just, uh, okay, I'm just going to be open with you. Everything in the church every Sunday was like that. Jesus died for you. He died for all of your sins. He rose again from the dead. Through faith in him, you can have everlasting life. That is so, so, so important. But I was never really taught about how my Lord and Savior Jesus is alive and all the things that he's doing for me right now in heaven. You know, we have a high priest who's standing in the very presence of God the Father, constantly interceding for us. I was never really taught to depend on the Holy Spirit. I just happened to be a kid who was good at not doing bad things. I'll just tell you all. Some of you are like, I was really good at doing bad things, okay? Right? But I was just kind of like, whatever, stubborn or whatever. I, I, did, I wasn't attracted to bad things. And that was the influence of God and the Spirit in my life, for sure. But I never asked the Spirit of God to change anything about me. I never lived really in dependence on the Spirit of God. We've got to do that. Right? We, can, we can go through life, do you see what I'm saying? Where everything's in the past tense. 
Instead of realizing that we have a living Savior to live in the fear of the Lord. We have a living King and we're living our lives before Him. I have a living Holy Spirit in me who never leaves me, who sticks with me. Even when I do bad stuff, he's there. Oh, that's, I don't like it when somebody's right next to me when I'm doing something bad. But he's always in me. He's with me. I need to live that way. My oldest son has gone off to college. I've shared this with you. And uh, he's there, and I'm here, and I used to see him face to face all the time. You know, most every day I would see him, and we'd talk and interact somehow. But now I don't see him. He doesn't see me. Now, my son, off at college, even though I've blessed him and raised him and I'm paying for school and giving him a cell phone and all things, I love it. I'm glad I can do it. Yeah, all those things, he could live like I'm dead. Really. He could live his life and not have any real fellowship connection with me at all. But when he picks up the phone and he calls me, which it's rare, but okay, it happens. When he picks up the phone and he calls me, I pick it up. It's wonderful. Because I still want to be connected to him. I don't want him to live as though I'm dead. I want him to like come home at Thanksgiving. I want to feel a connection to him, all those kinds of things. It's the same way with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He has ascended into heaven. He's ascended to heaven. It's true. And we don't see him face to face. But he is alive. And he cares about you and me. He wants the best for you and me. And so that's what these early Christians were taking hold of. They didn't see Jesus anymore, but they knew that he was alive. His resurrection and his ascension didn't mean that it all just stopped there. Their Christian lives just didn't end in the moment that they came to believe in Jesus. They were living in fellowship with Jesus. They were still following their king. He was alive. They lived in the fear of the Lord. Do you hear it here? That's the different mindset that they had. Now, Peter's miracles just confirm what we're talking about. They confirm what we're talking about right now. Here they are. Now, as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydda. Here's a picture of the ruins of this village. You can see it right here in the foreground. And then before that is what's called the Sharon Plain. And that stretches all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. So this is about 25 miles away from Jerusalem. And then it's about 10 more miles to get to the ocean and to another town we're going to talk about called Joppa. Here's a map of what we're talking about. Just so that you know, this is rooted in real history. Jerusalem is here. Peter's going to travel towards the coast. It's about 30, 35 miles total in what we're going to read today. What's important is then he's going to make his way up the coast later where he's going to encounter a Roman centurion, Cornelius, who becomes the pattern for every one of us today. Before that happens, though, Luke wants us to know how authoritative Peter was. He wants us to know when Peter's there, Jesus is there. So here's what happens. There he found in this village a man named Aeneas. He's visiting Christians. We just read that. He's visiting the saints, set apart people. That's who we are as believers. And he encounters a man named Aeneas who had been bedridden eight years, unable to care for himself. People had to take care of him, for he was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. In fact, the language here is, he's already healed you. I'm just announcing to you, you are healed. Get up. And make your bed. And immediately he got up. And so parents, this Thanksgiving week, I do want you to know, (laughs) if you're looking for a verse, it's right here. God says to make your bed. Okay. And when when they're like, yeah, right. No, immediately. That's also important. Immediately. You don't wait, right? Well, Peter said that because he was a man who had been bedridden for eight years. And Peter says, get up and make your bed. You don't need anyone else to do that for you. You don't need to be taken care of. You can make your own bed. You can get up. You're fully restored. You can go back to like just a life like like he had known before. Peter. You know, when you encounter Peter, Peter was Peter. You hear it here? I mean, the apostle Peter. 
And he encounters this man. I don't know how as a prophet this totally works with God, how God tells a prophet, like, do this miracle or I've, I've done. Peter's just announcing it. Jesus Christ has healed you. He, the Spirit is telling me you are already actually healed. And notice Peter's words. This is so important. Jesus Christ heals you. You know what he's saying? Jesus Christ is alive. And he is powerful. And it's not me. It's not anything that I've done or anything that I've said. Jesus has healed you because he is alive. See how these miracles confirm it? All who, here's what we read next, and all who lived at Lydda and Sharon in that plain in that area saw him and they turned to the Lord. This is a way of saying they became believers. Wow. Here's another miracle. Now in Joppa, on the coast, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated in Greek is called Dorcas. It's a word for a gazelle, which is a beautiful thing. For <laughs> Gazelles are supposed to be beautiful in the Bible, okay? Just so you know. It's a compliment. This woman was abounding with deeds of kindness and charity, which she continually did. She's a disciple. She is a believer. She's following her Lord. She's like telling us just what we were reading earlier, she's abounding in all kinds of good deeds. She is building up the Christian community. Do you hear her? She, she's an incredible Christian woman is what we're reading here. And it happened, now we read this next, and it happened at that time that she fell sick and died. You know, no doubt the Christians were praying for her. You know, when someone is sick and they're dying and you pray and you pray, but She died. And she was a wonderful Christian woman. You know, sometimes we get sick as Christians because of God's discipline. It can happen. But here's a woman who's doing everything that she can to serve her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Incredible reputation. Luke couldn't give her any higher praise. But she gets sick. And she died. And when they had washed her body, preparing it for burial, they laid it in an upper room. So it was like a two-story home and an airy, airy, airy area on the top. And so they prepare her body for burial, and they put her body there. And they don't bury her right away, probably because of what we read next. Since Lydda was near Joppa, just happens to be, the story's like saying, now Lydda just happened to be near Joppa. The disciples, having heard that Peter was there, they had gotten word that Peter was in that Sharon Plain area, not far away, within 10 miles. They sent two men to him, imploring him, do not delay in coming to us. So Peter arose and went with them. When he arrived, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing all the tunics, shirts, and garments, and outer garments that Dorcas used to make while she was with them. Do you know what her abounding deeds and building the church up, you know what she was doing? She would make clothes for the widows of the church. So all the widows are even in the room and they're saying, they're wearing the clothes that she had made for them. And they're just weeping over their friend that they had lost. But Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. This is Peter. There was no one like Peter in their area. They went and got Peter. Said, Peter, can you do something? They had that hope. They had that belief. Maybe. And Peter Gets them all out of the room. And as we read this, you're supposed to remember, just so you know, Elijah and Elisha, the great prophets of the Old Testament, they too had raised someone to life who had died in an upper room and had removed all the people out of the room. They were just there alone with both of them young men. Now we have a young woman. And Peter prays. It's not him. It's not these magical words or anything else. And turning... We're excited about this. Turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. He commands it. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. Just imagine being Peter. 
And God is working through him. He's Peter. And by the way, God is confirming Peter's authority because he's about to go and lead a whole family of Gentiles to faith in Jesus. And he has to say, this is of God. Peter's special. And God somehow had communicated to Peter, command her to rise up again. He does it and she opens her eyes and takes a breath. Can you imagine that? And then imagine being her. You know, from what we read in Scripture, when you and I die as believers, she was a believer, our spirit goes to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And all of a sudden, she's back on earth again. And her eyes open up. Can you imagine? And she looks over and sees Peter. And she's in this upper room of her home all alone. And she had died. She had been sick. She had experienced all of that. She had been sick and she had died. And her eyes open up again and she sits up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. And calling the saints and the widows, he brought them all back. He presented her alive. Just like the great prophets, Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha lived in a time when the world and and the Israelites were turning everywhere but to God for life. They thought they could find life in other places. And God used Elisha and Elisha to prove over and over and over again, I'm the only God, the one true God, and I'm the only one who gives life. And in the same way, Peter was there, and remember, he was representing the living Jesus, the Son of God, He is alive. He is a God of life. And if you want life, there's one place to go, to Jesus. It became known all over then, all over Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. No doubt she made clothes for a lot of people. People knew her in her town. Because of her dying, but then coming back to life again, many people come to believe. See, these miracles prove that Jesus is alive. They prove that Jesus really did rise from the dead. And it's not only that he rose from the dead, it proves that he is still alive. These miracles are also for you and I today. They're important for us. Not only the miracle of Jesus rising again from the dead, but look at the miracle of Peter. We have a living Savior who's active and involved in our world today. He's a living Savior who cares for us, and he's given us his spirit who's alive in us as well. The message of a living, powerful Messiah. Do you hear that? This Thanksgiving, it's not just about the past. It's not just about what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. It's that we have a Savior who's alive right now. And it's that message that is a source of life, strength, and encouragement for you and your personal life and also for us as a church. If you want encouragement, if you want strength, You have to have a mindset that Jesus is alive and that his spirit is living in me. It's not just about what Jesus has done. It's about what Jesus is doing. Those are the things that are going to last. You know, the only things that are going to last for eternity are things that are aligned and connected to Jesus. He is the Lord. And to live in the fear of the Lord is an acknowledgement that the only things that last and really are going to matter when eternity is all said and done is going to be what's actually connected to him. I was just in Denver, Colorado, and I went to a church, and I was there for a three-day conference all about the Roman Empire and what it was like to live in the first century and getting into all those, the cultural backgrounds of all those things. I've been to Rome. Here's a picture of the Colosseum. It's incredible, the structure. You know, this is as big as an NFL stadium today. It could seat upwards of like 80,000 people in the Roman Colosseum. And I don't know if you know this, but the, the Colosseum was built with money from the destruction of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. The wealth that came out of the temple was used to fund and construct the Roman Colosseum. But today... If you get a Roma pass, that's my advice to you, get a Roman pass, you skip the line. You get to go right up to the front, and you walk into the Colosseum. You know the very first thing that you see when you walk into the Roman Colosseum? A cross. Because centuries later, after Christians had been martyred in this place, it became a church building. 
Christians would meet there. The Roman Empire has come and gone. Civilizations come and go. But the things that are connected to God and to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are going to last forever. When I was in, the, uh, in Colorado, I also went up to visit family in Estes Park, Colorado, in the Rocky Mountain National Park, and we drove into the park. There were snow flurries. It was really cold. But I look around, and I look at those mountains, and I look at, like, the pyramids, and I look at the Roman Colosseum and all those things, and these civilizations have come and gone, but the mountains are there. God's creation is there. The things of God last. One day, there's even going to be a whole new earth that Jesus is going to make. It's going to last forever and ever. The things of God last, the things of Jesus last. These are what the early Christians had this mindset. They're like, we're going to live in the fear of the Lord. He is resurrected from the dead. He is going to go on living forever. I want to live in the fear of him. I want to follow him as my king. I want to draw strength and encouragement and hope and build up other believers around me in that. We need to live with this kind of mindset today. We read this in the final verses. Peter stayed many days in Joppa with a tanner named Simon. Now, there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. So just to wrap it up here, not only did these miracles confirm, like I told you, that Jesus is alive, these miracles were confirmation that when Peter goes and and shares Jesus with Cornelius and the whole family and household in this Roman household who are non-Jewish people come to believe and the Spirit's poured out on them, it's proof that that really is of Jesus, that it's a thing of God, that you and I can rely on it today. So just to wrap up here, Let me put it to you this way. The Apostle Peter's miracles are not only proof that the Lord Jesus is alive, but proof that anyone who believes in Jesus, like Cornelius will in Acts chapter 10, whoever believes in Jesus as Savior can become a justified, forgiven child of God with the indwelling Holy Spirit. So if you want something wonderful to read this week, read on into Acts chapter 10. We'll come back to it next year. But Cornelius and his whole household come to believe in Jesus. They clearly receive the Spirit of God. That's what you and I experience today. And Peter's miracles not only prove that Jesus is alive, but that you and I do, can absolutely know for sure we're not only a child of God, but that the Spirit is living in us. Thanksgiving is a wonderful time where we get to share our thanks for things. And I just want to encourage you, don't let your Christian life simply be a faith of things in the past. You hear me? As wonderful as it is, it is so important. We take the Lord's Supper together to remember that Jesus died for us, what he did. We remember at Easter that he rose again from the dead. But every day of the Christian life, we should be living with a mindset that he is alive and that everyone in our life around us needs him. People are looking for peace. People are looking for some place to be encouraged. People are looking for hope. And we get to share that message. And when we do that and we're unified as a church, just like we read at the very beginning of this passage, things grow, God is at work, there's incredible peace, incredible encouragement. I read this from a chef about Thanksgiving. That was a really good quote. He says, what I love about Thanksgiving is that it's purely about getting together with friends or family and enjoying food. You know, a chef would say this. And it's really... It's really for everybody, and it doesn't matter where you're from. He said, there's just something special about Thanksgiving. Some of you are like, you don't know my family. Okay, all right. right. There's something special about Thanksgiving because everybody can agree on that it's fun to eat. You know what I mean? That we're just going to sit down and have this meal together. For whatever else is going on, we can sit down and we can eat together. And we know Thanksgiving is not just about food. That's not really, it's about giving thanks to God. But I loved his words because he says it's really for everybody. That everybody can agree, let's sit down and let's, let's eat together. And what I'm trying to tell you today is that Jesus is for everybody. Jesus is for everybody. He is alive He is a living Savior. I know that it was 2,000 years ago, but he is alive right now. He is a living Savior, and you and I as the church can build up the church, and new people can come to believe in Jesus, even surprising people. 
So I want to encourage you this Thanksgiving, make this Thanksgiving one where you're living out that Jesus is alive. Follow me? To approach this Thanksgiving, it really should be for every day, but this Thanksgiving and looking at the whole book of Acts here, make this, let's get back to the first century. Let's get back to these early Christians and what they were excited about, even though they faced hardship and even persecution. They were bold in sharing about Jesus Christ because they were convinced, not just about the past, but in the present, that Jesus is alive. And you and I get to share that with other people. So I encourage you this week, if you have that opportunity, or create the opportunity, when you're at Thanksgiving and you're sitting down for meals, it's a common thing. Let's share things that we're thankful for. Don't simply share that you're thankful for what Jesus has done for you in the past. Share what you're excited about right now. Share about this Sunday where we had 10 people step forward to be baptized, saying, you know what I want? I I already believe in Jesus, and he's washed you, and he cleansed me, but he's alive, and I want to follow him. Just to share, at my church Sunday, there were 10 people who were baptized, and we've had such bad news for these last couple of years. I am so excited. I'm so excited about what God is doing in Rio Rico, that there are already small groups forming there, that we're going to have a new location for our church in Rio Rico. I am excited about what God is doing. Jesus is alive. Lives are being changed. Share it. Some of you are like, well, again, you you don't know my family, but be ready for it. Prepare for it. I already have conversations I want to have this Thanksgiving, and I'm already plotting it in my mind. (laughs) And I'm already praying about it. Like, God, what are the right words? What might be the right approach to this? What can I say? And I'm already praying and just getting ready for that. This might help you. I've got a joke for you for this Thanksgiving. Do you know when turkeys are most grateful? The day after Thanksgiving. Okay. We better get out of here soon. But it might be something as dumb as that joke. (laughs) It may be something like that that opens up a spiritual conversation because what we're talking about this morning really is about life and death. It is. So whatever it might be that you can do just to kind of broach the subject or to turn things towards spiritual things, be prepared. Be ready. Have something that you're going to go to. Be praying about it right now. Make this Thanksgiving a day where you share in some way that Jesus is alive. Would you stand with me? Let's pray. Let's pray together. Father, we praise you for who you are. Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you for your great mercy. Thank you, Father, that it was all your plan to give your one and only son, the very son of God, to come to this earth, to die for our sins, to rise again from the dead. And Father, it was also your plan to exalt him, to bring him into your presence, to be seated at your right hand, ruling and reigning with you, Father. Thank you, Jesus, that you are alive today. Thank you for being our high priest. Thank you for how you care for us. And Spirit, we pray that you will glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That you will take our lives as we depend on you and transform them and change them so that the very life of Jesus Christ has lived through us. We pray in this holiday season, and we especially pray for this week, as we give thanks as we share our faith with other people, that it will come through our lives that we believe in a living Savior. Father, thank you for your word, how you inspired Peter to write that, Father, you have caused all of us as believers to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, thank you that we have a living Savior Help us to have that mindset as we go into our lives. Help us to share it with those people around us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.